Tell me about LSD and creativity. <laughs> uh, so this was a study, I talk about this in my book. Uh, I was like, working in, in the department in plant sciences in Cambridge and there was in the canteen, there was a poster on the wall and the poster said, do you have a meaningful problem that needs solving? And I was like, yes, yeah, I certainly do. Lots. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it said, if you do, then call this number. So I was like, okay, I'll call that number, you know, whatever, see what happens. So I called this number and it turned out that they were recruiting scientists to participate in a, a study into the effects of LSD on the problem solving ability of scientists. Uh, and I thought this sounded like a, a, a brave study. It's a difficult thing to assess, you know. But anyway, I signed up and they showed up in a hospital, a clinical trials unit of a hospital. They'd been quite sensitive. The researchers doing this study had, you know, they, they knew about psychedelics and they knew that the hospital room is not the nicest place to be tripping. And so they, they'd hung hangs on the wall and they had mood lights and nice music playing. And then the nurses administered the LSD and I, I was at this wonderful time uh, lying on this bed and, you know, going into these astonishing experiences. And um, at some point my, there was assist, an assistant with me and, and she said, um, maybe it's now it's time to start thinking about your work-related problem. And I was like, oh God, my work-related problem. And <laughs> it all becomes quite funny because a lot of life can become very amusing in these psychedelic states. The thing that was most amusing about it was when they came in with questionnaires. Because like this thing we were talking about, it's difficult to assess objectively people's subjective experiences. You know, the, my imagination was essentially the subject of this experience, but the only way that they could access my imagination was by asking me what I was imagining. And then I was observing myself, so, but I was also under the influence myself. So there's all these lovely tangles. But the funniest is the questionnaire would say something like, on the scale of one to... 10, how do you rate your experience of infinity? And I just collapsed into paralytic laughter, you know, and, and every time they had to answer this questionnaire several times over the course of the study, and every time it just got funnier and funnier. You could feel the scientific procedure groaning under the weight of what seemed to be an impossible task. But it was a brave and fascinating study because it was looking into creativity and imagination and asking questions about how we can approach that scientifically. And I think it was very difficult for them to unify the people's different experiences. You know, the experience of the mathematician next door would have been very different from my experience as a soil and fungal biologist. The kinds of problems that we were wrestling with would be very different kinds of problems. How do you compare those across a big sample? So I, I'm not sure what the enduring takeaway messages were from this. What did you take away from it? I took away a feeling that, that my mind was very much larger than I normally recognize that I spend time in this sort of small part of my mind, usually a uh, comparatively small part of my mind. But there were vast, wild reaches of, of my mind in which I didn't normally spend so much time. And when in this state, the familiar could become unfamiliar again. Which sounds like a very productive place to be. For me, yes. I find that some of the most helpful ideas that I have are when the familiar has become unfamiliar because you tend to see it more for what it is rather than see what you expect to find. Yes, and, and you're not taking the obvious for granted. Yeah, exactly. And it's the taking for granted that I think locks us up imaginatively a lot of the time. So I find it very helpful to be in that, that state of where, where the familiar, even like a light switch on the wall or a table or a chair can be quite funny because you, you, you recognize how absurd it is that we have this kind of furniture or, or, or tool in our lives. And so I find it very helpful to go into those places and very helpful for problem solving. And even if I don't solve the problem in any fixed way, just to re-enter the question with a sense of, of sort of childlike openness. Are you a different person after than you were before the experiment? I don't think I'm a different person before or after. Uh, I had had psychedelic experiences before this. So if it was the only psychedelic experience in my life, then it Maybe it would be a bit more like that, but it wasn't. So it was less of a watershed than that. Have you ever had a psychedelic experience not related to any type of plant or chemical? When I think of dreams, dreaming is a kind of psychedelic experience. You know, I mean, it's in the sense that, you know, psychedelic means mind manifesting. And when one dreams, one's mind is manifesting in all sorts of wild and fluid ways. So that's probably... 
the closest I've had that has not been chemically induced. A, a lot of people have very spontaneous and mystical experiences, you know, sometimes through traumas, traumatic accidents, and sometimes they just happen. Um, I don't think, I've never had a kind of spontaneous, just bolt out of the blue, psychedelic-like experience. I had bolts out of the blue, so powerful experience, a great numinosity and meaning, but, but I think dreaming is the closest. The shamans who work with ayahuasca explain that the way that the plant and the vine were put together to create the ayahuasca out of the thousands of plants available, the way that they knew to combine this two particular plants was the plants told them to do it. Have you ever had any experience with communicating with plants or fungi? Well, I've had a sense of, of porosity, of openness to plants and to fungi, where I'm feeling affected by them on some deep level. I haven't had an experience where a plant or a fungus has sort of arisen in my consciousness and spoken to me in English or any other sort of human language, but my feelings and my states and the kind of way my mind is exploring and imagining change for sure and have changed quite dramatically in, in different places with different plants or fungi. And I guess that's some kind of way to think about a communication going on. I'm sure that I've been altered chemically by, you know, being just surrounded by plants or being around in you know, the soil after it's rained and the smells that come out of the soil. We're being affected all the time, you know, and sometimes we notice, sometimes we don't. But I've never had a sense that, you know, this very plant here is now talking to me in that way. Um, it's been more subtle than that, I think. Do you ever speak to them, or shall I say, do you ever try to communicate with them? Well, I've actually been playing with this exercise recently with, with my wife, she's a poet, Erin Robinson, and we've been working on this exercise as a kind of game where so much of the way that we talk about the world is talking about the world and, and making the entities around us in the world into its. But what happens when we address the world directly? What happens when you turn the it into a you? And when you do that, you end up actually, it's happened for a very long time in all sorts of human cultures. It's usually called prayer, speaking directly to the world rather than about the world or speaking to beings rather than about those beings. And so the exercise that we've been practicing is, is a kind of writing, it's a poetic exercise of just writing, addressing some kind of entity or being around you, a rock, a stone, a cloud, the sun, the moon, a tree, a twig, a leaf, a frog, and just addressing them directly. Beautiful. And it's not necessarily that we're thinking that the frog will understand our human language, but it's more to try and find a way to behave as if humans aren't the only organisms worth addressing. And in doing so, to find a way into a very large body of practices that we might call the practices of prayer. Yeah, and it's recognizing a greater community around us that's always around us. Yeah. It's beautiful. And by turning the it into a you, you're making it a center of experience. You're granting it the possibility that it has an experience, you know, and that just seems like good manners. Absolutely.